like waiting? Are we waiting for like a uh, someone to turn all these on or? Oh, they're up now. Great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, Thank you. Ready to start? Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you so much for being here uh, in Stoughton uh, in a phenomenal location for this. I couldn't be more excited about this roundtable, which all started uh, with a call uh, from Bob Walleen uh, to me and then a meeting in my office uh, in De Pere in which he laid out uh, Stoughton's story and uh, I was captivated by it. And at the time we started brainstorming, was well, there something we could do with the select committee on China to shine a light on that story and use it as a way to talk about these broader issues we face in terms of this competition between the US and China. And then I thought if I'm going to be able to entice my ranking member and good friend Raja Krishnamurthy to cross the Illinois Wisconsin border uh, into forbidden territory here, I have to be willing to meet him halfway. So I couldn't do it in my district and Stoughton seemed like a logical destination. We could even persuade a, a Bears fan to come all the way up here. Uh, but does the air smell cleaner and sweeter on this side, Raja? Um, you know, uh, in Wisconsin, we have a proud history of, of making things. And, and for years, however, in the Midwest, we've been told that when we see boarded up factories or the rusting steel, uh, uh, rusting steel mills or laid off friends and relatives, that all of this was just an inevitable consequence of globalization. And for years, politicians in Washington and bankers in New York lectured us that the hollowing out of our towns was just the free market working its magic, that our friends were laid off, that were laid off should just move to the big cities, learn how to code, and get with the program. But the Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party came here today, today in the heart of the Midwest, far from the think tanks in D.C. where jobs and factories are often just numbers on a spreadsheet to explore a different thesis, which is that the decline of American industry is not inevitable and never has been. Deindustrialization is a policy choice, and it's been the favored choice of both parties for far too long. But more than Democrats or Republicans, American deindustrialization has been the favored policy choice of the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing. Here's what happens. China heavily subsidizes national champions in critical industries like steel, shipbuilding, automotive parts, electric batteries, photovoltaics, and countless other industries. And what does a favored Chinese company get? Well, they get free real estate. They get the state-mandated obliteration of all domestic competition within China. They get huge cash subsidies, practically free loans, and a total pass, a total pass on environmental standards, or workplace safety regulations, I would submit we probably couldn't hold a round table like this in your Chinese competitor factory. It wouldn't be safe for us. No pesky organized labor to give underpaid workers a way to complain because they know what happens when you complain. You disappear. And perhaps most egregious of all, a vast state-directed industrial espionage apparatus that's ready to coerce, hack, or steal any intellectual property or trade secrets that you need. Therefore, our companies, our companies in Wisconsin, our companies in Illinois, our companies across America are competing against Chinese firms that often literally cannot go bankrupt or be underpriced. And in the case of Stoughton Trailers, their Chinese competitors were selling products into the U.S. for less than the cost of the raw materials that were used to produce them. That's not competition. That's not fair competition in any meaningful sense. That's that's an economic disease that's eaten away at the fabric of our communities here for decades. And for years, I would submit that people in the Midwest, particularly Wisconsin, have understood what Washington is now just waking up to, which is that China doesn't play by the rules. The Chinese Communist Party's mercantilist industrial policy, it's underpricing, it's overpromising, it's dumping, and the U.S. markets have, has had devastating consequences for American workers, American manufacturers, and American national security. It's not a mystery why manufacturing in the Midwest has been hollowed out. It's a miracle that we still have strong manufacturing as a result of this naivety. Now, the good news is that we still have tools at our disposal to respond to this aggression. We could have a renaissance of making things here in America. 
Tariffs, when applied strategically to heavily subsidized PRC industries, not only reduce reliance on China, but also increase domestic manufacturing. Import exclusion orders prohibit goods produced using stolen intellectual property from entering the United States. Targeted economic incentives in clearly defined and narrowly tailored sectors to offset the PRC industrial policies can restore American competitiveness in key areas, strengthening our economy and our national security. And finally, this afternoon, we're going to hear uh, from Stoughton trailers about how trade remedies like countervailing duties can be used to level the playing field. And here we have, with Bob and his team here at Stoughton, an inspiring example of how American grit and determination can stand up to adversarial aggression. But they can't be our first line of defense against the CCP's trade warfare. We need to design trade incentive and regulatory systems that allow our manufacturing sector to flourish. The Chinese Communist Party is breathing down the neck of the American manufacturing worker, and Congress, in a bipartisan fashion, needs to safeguard our industry, push back on China's rapacious trade practices, and start stamping made in America on more things that are made here in the Midwest. And with that, I'd like to turn over to my friend, my colleague, uh, the pride of Illinois, uh, uh, but who's, who's someone who's just been an absolute pleasure uh, to work with and whose leadership and, and courage and conviction and investigatory experience on these issues I truly admire and I've learned a lot from my friend Raja Krishnamurthy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And indeed, as a Bears fan, it does feel like a diplomatic mission coming up here to Packers country. Um, but if there's one thing that two NFL partisans can put aside their differences about is how do we stand up for American workers? How do we stand up for American companies like Stoughton Trailers? And how do we combat economic aggression from the Chinese Communist Party? And I want to echo my chairman's sentiments uh, about, Bob, thank you so much for hosting us today. Um, and thank you to all of you for participating. And thank you for your leadership, Mr. Chairman, and putting this together. Look, one of the biggest challenges that we have is not the lions and the Vikings. It's the Chinese Communist Party. Think about it this way. A little more than 20 years ago, the U.S. normalized trade relations with the PRC, the People's Republic of China. It's almost like bringing an expansion team into the NFL. Now, when you bring a new team into the league, there's an expectation that the team will play by the same rules. They'll have 11 players on the field, line up behind the line of scrimmage, and follow the orders of the referee. But the problem is the CCP never intended to follow the rules. And they've created an environment in which they regularly, unfairly have an advantage over their competitors. Why do we know this? Because they told us they would do this. Just two years ago, Long Young Tu, the chief negotiator for the PRC's accession into the World Trade Organization, said in an interview that, quote, when we promised to adopt a market economy, we made it absolutely clear that it would be a socialist market economy. What does that mean? A socialist market economy means it's a place where the CCP and the Chinese government regularly interfere in the economy to favor Chinese companies and Chinese products. It means they steal intellectual property. It means they manipulate their currency. It means they dump their goods below the cost of making them. And unfair, unfortunately, it also means uh, that we have to stand up to them. We don't let football teams on the field with 15 players. We don't let them have six downs instead of four. And we don't let them decide which penalties they can and won't follow. Since we've left the CCP on the playing field, our teams have felt the impact. According to a report from the 2020 Economic Policy Institute study, my district, the 8th Congressional District in Illinois, has had more than 15,000 jobs displaced because of unfair practices by the CCP. That is the most, the most of any congressional district anywhere in the state of Illinois. And that's another reason why uh, I'm proud to be here today standing up to the CCP. Each of those people in my district and in yours, 
who, lo who lost a job, have a rent or a mortgage to pay, they have a kitchen table to put food on, they might have kids they need to provide for, and it's for them we have to make this situation right. First, we have to make this right by enforcing the rules that we all are supposed to abide by. Second, we make it right by investing in our own team, namely American companies and workers, because we know American working men and women and companies can outcompete anyone if they're on a level playing field. Finally, we can make this situation by, right by building on the progress we've made in the last couple of years in Congress, including by passing the Chips and Science Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, among others. I know we can because the stakes are too high, even higher than the Bears versus Packers. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and working alongside the chairman and the rest of our committee to address these challenges and delivering for our American companies and our American working people. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. I want to recognize now another uh, representative from Illinois. I am, I'm outnumbered. I'm surrounded here. Um, uh, Darren LaHood. Two quick things about Darren LaHood. Uh, Darren is the... Uh, a, the best basketball player in the United States Congress. Uh, admittedly, it's a very low bar, uh, but he's very good. Um, and uh, B, um, as we seek to take actions to defend ourselves and rebalance this economic relationship with China, Darren's a real expert on how we simultaneously seek to open markets in other parts of the world and make sure that we have a proactive trade agenda in, in as at the same time we develop the robust defensive agenda against China's predatory trade practices. So, Darren LaHood. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Stoughton today, and um, I represent the 16th District of Illinois. Uh, I have two-thirds of the Wisconsin-Illinois border. I'm glad my visa was approved to get into Wisconsin today, uh, and uh, I know it's only a short period I have here, but uh, I thought I'd be greeted with more cheese products when I got here, but uh, anyway, I'm happy to be here uh, with uh, two good friends, uh, Ranking Member Christian Morte and obviously Chairman Gallagher. I think it's worth um, reminding everybody, um, th this committee, the uh, committee uh, on the select, the select committee on China, was created this year in January in a bipartisan effort. Uh, it was, I think, one of the best things we've done this Congress was Speaker McCarthy uh, bringing this to the floor. We had a hundred Democrats supported on the House floor, and the thing the CCP fears the most is bipartisan support against them. Uh, and this committee has worked diligently and substantively over the last eight months to lay out that framework. And this is another piece of that being here today, uh, to, to take what we learned today back to Washington, D.C. Um, I, I will say, uh, I, I'm here today to talk about a specific company in my district. Um, I, I wanna focus my remarks on a company called Plews and Edelman, which is a small manufacturing company headquartered in the heart of my district in Dixon, Illinois, about 100 miles south of here. Um, and I'd like to recognize David Rashid and Dan Billy, whom uh, both made the trip here today. Uh, thank both of them for coming in for their participation in this round table. Let me tell you a little bit about Plews and Edelman. It's a 113 year old designer, manufacturer and distributor of power steering products for North America automotive aftermarket uh, with facilities in Dixon, Illinois and also in Mexico. Additionally, it should be noted that Plews takes great pride in keeping a majority of their supply chain in North America with over 90% of their component suppliers based in the United States. Blue's primary competitor is a public CCP subsidized state-owned enterprise company named Sun Song, a company headquartered in China with a US subsidiary in Western Ohio. As a supplier of specialty rubber products, as part of a focus industry by the CCP under the Made in 2025 program, Sunsong is engaged in predatory pricing with the help of generous government subsidies and fraudulent transshipping maneuvers to make it near impossible for Plews and Edelman uh, of the market to compete. Let me explain further. Sunsong manufactures their product in China. Prior to implementations of the tariffs in 2019, they shipped their products directly to the United States. But when the tariffs went effect, went into effect in 2019, they began to ship their products through two separate entities in Thailand. Prior to shipping them then to the United States in a blatant effort to evade the 301 tariffs. Their supply chain process is simple. Sunsong sends their product to Thailand, effectively slaps a made in Thailand label on it, and then ships the product along to the US at a 30% 
lower cost than that of Clues and other, com uh, other competitors. Most recently, Sunsong has set, their own has set up their own subsidiary in Thailand to maximize this effort. Over the past five years, Palouse and Edelman has endured an incredible amount of adversity in trying to compete with the state-owned enterprise of Sunsong, forcing the company to continuously restructure their business model, condense their product line, and let employees go when they had no other option. In speaking with Plews and Edelman about their situation, it is clear to me that the federal government needs to do a better job and be more, uh, be more equipped to quickly and efficiently support our small and medium-sized manufacturers by pushing back against Chinese companies like Sunsong that don't play by the same rules and standards and laws that every other industrialized country in the world does. Over the past three years, Plews has gone to the Customs and Border Protection Agency they have explored avenues at the Department of Commerce, and they have extent, had extensive conversations with the a Trade Fraud Task Force through the U.S. Department of Justice seeking help. Unfortunately, these entities have either provided zero help or they have an internal process that takes way too long to address the matter before impactful business decisions have to be made. Through my time on the Select Committee on China, as well as my role on the Ways and Means Committee, Trade Subcommittee, I've seen numerous examples of, rate, of blatant and rampant trade fraud and tariff evasion by Chinese SOEs. And through these examples, it is clear that we do not have sufficient mechanisms in place to support U.S. companies like Plews and Edelman in a way that is swift and steadfast in protecting against extreme harm from these Chinese predatory SOEs. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you. I want to thank Stoughton uh, and Bob for having us here today and for hosting today's roundtable. And I wanna thank our participants that are here today to share their business stories. And I hope we can take this discussion back, back to Washington DC and find ways from a public policy standpoint to better support businesses across the country that are facing similar problems of CCP-backed competitors not playing by the same set of rules. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaHood. We're now gonna hear from three of our panelists uh, and then we'll open it up to a wide ranging discussion with everybody else on the panel. And really the goal of this is not only to shine a light on what some of these companies are, are facing uh, and the nature of the Chinese economic threat, but also to identify creative uh, and productive solutions going forward that we can take back to DC and ultimately can pass in the 118th Congress, even though it is a divided uh, Congress. That's what the speaker and the majority leader have asked us to do. And that's why we're convening this roundtable today. So with that, I will turn it over to our gracious host, Bob Walleen, uh, the president and CEO of Stoughton Trailers. Uh, thank you so much for having us here. It's a beautiful facility and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member and committee members. On behalf of Stoughton Trailers, thank you for the opportunity to appear before the select committee and welcome to Wisconsin. Purposeful unfair trade is a feature of Chinese Communist Party's economic policy, and U.S. manufacturers like Stoughton suffer as a result. Your work to address unfair Chinese trade practices is essential to enhancing America's economic competitiveness. In 1961, my father took a risk and purchased the assets of a small distressed trailer manufacturer in Stoughton, Wisconsin. Because of his hard work and the work of countless others since then, Stoughton Trailers has become the fourth largest U.S. trailer producer, employing more than 2,300 American workers in three states. Stoughton produces trailers that keep American supply chains moving, including dry vans, refrigerated trailers, grain trailers, and intermodal container chassis. Despite this growth, We've also experienced severe challenges in the past decade due to unfair competition from Chinese state-owned companies. Our primary foreign competitor has long been one of China's prized state-owned enterprises, CIMC. CIMC's primary shareholder is the Chinese government. As the select committee is aware, China's state council and the CCP's Central Committee directly manage the decision-making of SOEs like CIMC. CIMC is a key element in the Chinese government's strategy to dominate global shipping services and maritime equipment production. To secure its status as the world's factory, China also needs to secure the means to delivering those goods around the world. 
To that end, the government of China bestows massive subsidies on CIMC, allowing it to sell products far below fair value and drive out market-based companies, including American companies. Stoughton has seen this firsthand, the destructive results of this strategic government support. In the early 2010s, Stoughton produced 53-foot shipping containers. We saw trade relief from imports of those containers from CIMC and other Chinese producers. The U.S. Department of Commerce found that CIMC dumped containers in the United States and received significant government subsidies to produce them. Unfortunately, the International Trade Commission made a negative finding and we were forced to shut down our container manufacturing operations. Now, Chinese container manufacturers produce nearly all of the shipping containers used in the United States and control more than 90% of the global market. More recently, our intermodal chassis operations faced a similar challenge from CIMC imports. Chassis are fabricated steel trailers used to move shipping containers. In the early 2000s, we saw a massive surge in CIMC chassis at heavily dumped and subsidized prices. As part of a coalition of other U.S. chassis manufacturers, Stoughton brought trade cases against these unfair imports. The Commerce Department found CIMC subsidiaries received subsidies of 44% of their values and that they were dumping into the United States at rates over 144%. This time, the International Trade Commission found in our favor and we were granted trade relief. The remedial benefits were immediate. Prior to trade relief, only 5% of chassis registered for those use in America were made here. Last year, roughly 50% of registered chassis were made in the United States. Stoughton was able to make new investments into chassis production, including a new facility in Waco, Texas. We hired hundreds of new employees. More broadly, U.S. supply chains are now far less reliant on Chinese state-owned entities for vital transportation equipment. Traditional countervailing duties are a useful tool to counteract strategic subsidies, but U.S. CBD law must keep up with evolving schemes. The government of China's Belt and Road policy provides subsidies to companies in neighboring countries. Current Department of Commerce regulations, however, prohibit accessing duties for these transnational subsidies through commerce, though commerce has proposed eliminating this provision for future consideration. China's Belt and Road Initiative subsidies have the same injury effect on American manufacturers as other Chinese subsidies and eliminating these restrictions on countervailing transnational subsidies would help fully address strategic subsidization. Strategic subsidies also facilitate duty evasion. For example, we believe CIMC receives subsidies to establish a facility in Thailand, which it uses to avoid duties by transshipping Chinese chassis. U.S. Custom, Customs recently initiated an Enforce and Protect Act investigation into this facility. We are hopeful that Customs will issue a positive result in this event investigation soon. We also face the issue of country hopping. U.S. industries bring successful trade remedy cases often against China only to see the same producers reappear in, neighboring, in a neighboring country with the same unfair trade practices. Trade cases are time consuming and resource intensive and domestic manufacturers can suffer significant economic harms while pursuing further cases. Congress should streamline successive trade remedy cases and quickly respond to country hopping by passing the pending Leveling the Playing Field 2.0 Act. At Stoughton, we believe at Amer that American workers and American products are the best in the world. Our trailers can stand up against any competitor when we have a level playing field, but we cannot compete against the full weight of the government of China. We urge the select committee to investigate the CCP's subsidies further and advocate for countervailing measures, counteracting measures. Thank you again. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Bob. I'll now recognize Mamoun Rashid, the CEO of Oxen Solar. Thank you so much for making time to be here. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman.
Chairman Gallagher, Ranking Member Krishna Murthy, and distinguished members of the Select Committee. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me to share my views about trade challenges faced by U.S. domestic manufacturers because of the unlawful trade behavior by Chinese companies, which are largely affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party. My name is Mamoon Rashid, and I'm co-founder and chief executive officer of Oxen Solar. Oxen Solar is the lo longest running crystal and solar module manufacturer in the U.S. My business partner, Sherry Tai, and I founded Oxen Solar in 2008. And at that time, we've been, since that time, we've been paying high paying jobs, we've been providing high paying jobs to our employees in Silicon Valley, California. At present, we employ 37 full-time employees and we produce solar panels for a variety of residential, commercial, and utility applications throughout the United States. I want to take a few moments to provide you my view and historical assessment of the competitive landscape in the solar business as we take on Chinese imports. When we founded Oxen Solar in 2008, we forecasted that solar cells and solar modules would eventually become commodity products that could compete on cost basis with traditional energy sources. This has come true. Solar deployment is reaching year-over-year all-time highs because of cost parity with traditional energy sources. With our low overhead, competitive costs, and high employee retention rates, we should have been printing money in a growing demand environment. What we didn't account for when we started Oxus Solar was the anti-competitive behavior of China and the success that China would have in dominating the solar supply chain. Before China was even a blip on the solar supply radar, there were dozens of solar manufacturers in the United States, and our chief competition came from Europe and Japan. This was fundamentally fair competition because all of us had the same cost burdens and had to play by market rules. In fact, we used to collaborate on technological improvements. Winning a sale meant winning it at, on merits. China wanted to be in on solar manufacturing. Because they, were, because they were so far behind, they stole technology to try to quickly catch up. Solar World and others in the United States had cyber intrusions and hacking. Then after Solar World stood up to Chinese dumping in 2011, China retaliated against U.S. polysilicon companies by placing draconian anti-dumping duties on imports from the United States. China then used its industrial policies to build the upstream supply chain from polysilicon to ingot, growing to wafer making and eventually to sell and module production. China, Chinese industrial policy and state subsidies assisted major Chinese solar companies in their evasion of U.S. anti-dumping and countervailing duties. Just 10 years later, China now dominates the world's, supply, the world's solar supply chain, accounting for 90% of polysilicon used in solar panels and 96% of, of the world's wafer supply. China employ, employs forced labor practices to mine polysilicon. They use coal-fired energy to power ingot and wafer making, and they take advantage of loopholes in enforcement of U.S. trade laws. Not surprisingly, this unlawful and immoral behavior has hollowed out the domestic solar industry. Domestic suppliers of our bill of materials closed as nearly every domestic module manufacturer went out of business. Others tried to enter the market, but the Chinese dominance was too significant. We, were, we are one of the last to remain standing. We continued producing OEM for major brands and major projects, including the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, Georgia, the McCoy Center in Columbus, Ohio, and major solar farms in New Jersey. We were also producing specialty products for national security objectives of the United States. In 2016, we were one of the first to launch bifacial modules and today, bifacial modules represent a, the vast majority of deployed modules. As I appear here today, our team is actively commissioning an expansion of our production and production capability to produce the next generation of solar modules using larger cells. Oxen Solar is now positioned to be one of the first domestic producers 
of M10 size modules. We were right in 2008 when we opened. We were right in 2016 when we developed the bifacial technology, and we are right to reinvest in larger format modules now. It just shows that despite all the trade headwinds we've faced, American ingenuity and know-how can persist if given the opportunity. Opportunity comes through smart policy and smart trade enforcement. The headwinds we faced persisted longer than I would have hoped for. In fact, I'm appearing before you today in 2023, just a few weeks after the Commerce Department validated our concerns that trade cheating was occurring by the Chinese, dating all the way back to 2012. Based on import data trends, we believe Chinese have been cheating to evade the anti-dumping and countervailing duty orders and Commerce validated our concerns. When we filed our request with Commerce, the Chinese tried to scare us into withdrawing our fair trade, uh, fair trade petition. Just like Solar World was hacked in 2012, we were hacked last year. Our customer list was stolen. Our intellectual property was accessed. We were locked out of our servers. We were locked out of our uh, security servers as well. In addition, our ability to raise capital, hire new employees for our ongoing expansion and secure new sales opportunities continue to be hampered by misinformation campaigns launched online about Oxen Solar, about our employees, and me personally. I'm glad we persisted, though. Commerce's circumvention determination is so important because it sends a signal that trade cheating will not be tolerated by the United States. Anytime an American manufacturer is competing on a level playing field, there is high likelihood the U.S. is going to win. This seems to be a recurring theme uh, this afternoon. Of course, right now there is a tariff moratorium in place, which means the duties are not being collected at present, but may begin as soon as June 2024. Strong trade enforcement along with incentives for domestic content should result in a boom to American manufacturing, and Oxen Solar intends to be a part of that. It cannot come soon enough. But the one thing I've learned over the last several years is that you cannot out-subsidize China. And rest assured, the Chinese Communist Party will be developing ways to counteract IRA, or rather, to benefit from it. A way for IRA to be helpful is for trade enforcement to remain as high as a high priority for the U.S. government. And we need to develop rules to avoid the absurd result of American taxpayer money going into the pockets of those in the Politburo. Standing up to China has not been easy for a company like Oxen Solar that many call too small to matter. But we're small because the Chinese have been too good at stifling our growth through unfair competition. The least I can say is that we didn't go out of business. I'm pleased that the select committee is holding this hearing. It's incredibly important. We need to counteract the Chinese dominance of the solar supply chain for our energy security. And make no mistake about it, China's dominance of the solar supply chain is a matter of national security. We should be asking ourselves whether we want the Chinese Communist Party to control our electricity grid. We should be asking ourselves if the Chinese Communist Party will stifle our ability to meet our carbon neutral goals by imposing export restraints on key technology or halting sales of solar to the US. And we should be asking ourselves if we are okay with meeting our carbon objectives on the backs of forced labor from massive expansion in coal-fired plants and from intellectual property theft. In closing, thank you again for this opportunity to testify today. On behalf of the families and Oxen Solar, that Oxen Solar employs back home in San Jose, we're very grateful for the work this committee and staff are doing to ensure that American manufacturers are not put out of business by concerted efforts by the Communist Party. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rashid. Uh, now I recognize Steve Kramer, the president of United Steelworkers, Local 9777. Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invite up here to, where are we at again? No. Oh, Wisconsin. Thank you. Uh, God's country. Uh, as a, uh, my apologies. Uh, as a lifelong Bears fan, <laughs> I've been in therapy for many decades now, but we're getting there. So uh, I really appreciate it. Chairman Gallagher, thank you. Ranking member Kristen Morphy, and I practice his name endlessly. 
We're good friends. I call him Raj all the time. One of the best of the best. So thank you. And all the other members and everyone here. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Steve Kramer. I've been a steel worker for almost 43 years now. I started out in a company now called Allied Tube on the south side of Chicago, the steel and pipe mill. We had close to 500 members there. Now we're down to about 390. Some of the effects of that is the direct imports from China. This company is on the south side of Chicago. Work, I've been working here for over 30 years as an operator and a millwright. But remaining time now, I uh, had the privilege and opportunity to be a full-time union president. Uh, for all my members, I have over 1,800 members spread out through the Chicagoland area. My responsibility to the workers of 38 different operations and corporations that mostly manufacture products in the Chicago area. These companies are small and medium-sized factories where USW members do everything from fabricating steel, making furniture, baking ice cream cones, uh, creating chemicals, and many other industries we represent. These workers take pride in everything they do every day. They should be excused for thinking about more uh, and making it their shift safely and getting home to their loved ones than they do about global competition. With a country over 7,000 miles away, this is on a lot of the working people that I work with, the brothers and sisters on their mind every day. However, in my role, I see the real world impacts of anti-competitive practices done by the companies based in China. Take for example, Bradfoot Gear Works. A number of years ago, this plant employed up to 500 workers, but today they only have about 80 or 90 employees. 20 years ago, the company featured their $50 million investment to make gears for wind towers. Today, been holding their own, but have not been growing. A big reason they're just holding on is that while gearboxes require precision manufacturing production, it is concentrated in a few locations with nearly half the factories in China. Unfortunately, China massive subsidies of technology have propelled its own producers over U.S. firms, shut the U.S. out of China's wind market, driven down world prices, and caused lost sales in the U.S. markets. Pipe and two mills have felt the same effects. The devastating, it's devastating any time I get a call or get the word, like I did around Christmas time last year. The mill was going down to this three days right before Christmas. Had a devastating effect on all the members, every employee that worked at that company. You can imagine how it feels not to have a full paycheck right before the holidays. So these couple of examples are why our elected leaders need to do more to foster domestic manufacturing. This starts with smart, targeted trade enforcement to defend American workers from illegal subsidies and anti-competitive practices. I visit manufacturing plants nearly every day, and I know that they have a level, if they have a level playing field, our members can outperform and always do outperform anyone in the world. The 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum have allowed the five pipe and tube mills I'm responsible for servicing to stabilize. They've helped, but workers and employees know elected officials can create uncertainty by undermining them. They need to be long-term, certainly to incentivize manufacturers to invest. That is why the USW is supportive of legislation that would update our trade laws including Leveling the Playing Field Act 2.0. We must ensure that our trade rules don't let China uh, content slip through other countries. We also need to invest in our workers. According to the government accountability offices, the U.S. spends less than 0.1% of our country's gross domestic product on job training, while our competitors in Europe, spend nearly four times that amount. 
There was a bit of culture shock for our young people, our next generation, when they come to manufacturing. The needs of the 38 plants that I represent are each going to be slightly different, and Congress should support collective bargaining agreements which have job training language, what we call internal apprenticeships. These are job training programs that can be between a workplace, a union, and potentially a school. Often some of the best training we can receive is simply having someone experienced there with you. It is essentially a big brother or big sister mentor program that can help a worker orient themselves into this new environment. The union is also supportive of the domestic investments in our infrastructure, clean energy, and manufacturing. The Build America, Buy America initiative also ensures that our tax dollars go to American manufacturers and should be strongly implemented and enforced. Finally, we need to recognize that strong domestic unions, unlike the state-run unions in China, are a valuable tool to improve the lives of all working people. Republicans and Democrats have, a long, have long recognized this. Even President Reagan supports workers in Poland as they rose up and fought for the right to have an independent trade union. Our country has faced many threats since our founding fathers. However, I believe in our democracy and that our ingenuity will if Congress sets the right policy, allows us to counter even the worst of Chinese practices. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Again, thank you very much. I'm privileged and honored to be here. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, we now have a, a challenge, which is that we have an incredible group of leaders that represent a diverse mix of businesses here. We have less than an hour to have an open discussion uh, and hear from as many people as possible. In the interest of time, I will save my question until the end or at the appropriate moment. I'll uh, allow uh, the ranking member to, to ask a question to start us off if you have one or I do. Or ha give me one of those Oreos. So yeah. I, I was very hungry. And so my staff brought me some Oreos. But on a more serious note, the reason why I have this Oreo is because I wanted to talk about the theft of intellectual property. And I was hoping to have somebody on this panel talk about that. It turns out that the, my staff, my crack staff, discovered that the white cream inside this Oreo has something called titanium dioxide. And titanium dioxide um, was developed in a process at DuPont Chemical um, and is a $17 billion market to whiten products like the cream in this Oreo. And guess who tried to steal the secret to developing titanium dioxide? Well, it's none other than the Chinese Communist Party. And the only reason we found this out, Mike, is that the Department of Justice found out through some witnesses that there was a scheme to steal and then sell the secrets to this titanium dioxide to uh, a Chinese company. That was subsidized heavily by the CCP. And uh, um, if it were not for the DOJ, I may not have this Oreo at yeah. this moment right now. Um, but on a more serious note, I would just be curious if anybody on this panel has had any experience with the theft of intellectual property by the CCP or a Chinese company. And um, anything that you do uh, to protect your IP as a consequence of it. Any volunteers? And, and while we wait for a brave soul, I need to test the Oreo to taste the titanium dioxide to see. I got a broken one. All right. I can see. Joe, and please um, uh, say who you are and, and what company you're from. Well, thank you. My name is Joe Dillon. I'm president of Insyncorator. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation to talk a little bit about what's going on with, I would say, cheating in China. That's a theme that I kind of heard across many dimensions. But since you asked about intellectual property, uh, so I mentioned that I'm from Insyncorator. For, for those who don't know, Insyncorator is, is the world leader in garbage disposals. Uh, just down the road in Racine, Wisconsin, founded uh, 85 years ago. We're celebrating our 85th anniversary. Um, and uh, so we're a proud uh, manufacturer. We employ nearly 1,000 U.S. workers. 
uh, in Wisconsin uh, to design, uh, manufacture, uh, and support the industry, like I said, for, for garbage disposals. Um, we actually just last year were acquired by Whirlpool, for those who don't know. Uh, so we're now part of Whirlpool Corporation, another proud uh, US manufacturer just across the lake in Michigan headquartered. Um, but I think on the, on the intellectual property front, for years, because we are the world leader and we have the best technology and we're constantly investing in innovation, we find that our competition, which is really all in China, uh, is constantly stealing our technology. Uh, and we have to fight that. Uh, we engage uh, on an aggressive basis uh, to fight those, those uh, infringing products as they come into our shores, as well as we fight them overseas, when we find them overseas. Uh, there, uh, our patents give our advantage to our product, and, and so we have to defend that. We also find, in some cases, the products that come in look like our product. So our product has a distinctive look. It could confuse the consumer. Uh, when they see a product that looks very similar to ours, they may buy it by mistake. Uh, so that's something we're constantly defending ourselves from, I would say, intellectual property theft from companies that are operating in China. Any other thoughts on intellectual property theft? Any other? If not, I'll, if Darren, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. A particular company in my district, uh, Plews and Edelman. Is, Mike is, it, on is it on or is it just not? Oh, it's on. Yeah, it's uh, I'm, close I mentioned to it. Um, I mentioned earlier in my opening statement about the company in my district, Plews and Edelman. Um, and I'd, I'd like to ask uh, David Rashid, who's here. Um, David, can you talk? I, I, just to remind folks, uh, Plews and Edelman is a uh, auto parts aftermarket company that deals with power steering equipment, been around 113 years. Uh, David, when we think about the disadvantage, um, the cost disadvantage that SOEs, uh, Chinese manufacturers have over domestic companies, can you talk about your own experience uh, and um, suggestions from a public policy standpoint, what we should be looking at? So thank you, first of all, for inviting me today, uh, Chairman Gallagher, Ranking Member Krish Krishnamuthi, <laughs> and, and of course, Congressman uh, LaHood. And uh, thank you very much, everyone here. Um, so when we're talking about my, the company that I compete with is a public company. And so they are very explicit in some documents. They recently listed on the Beijing Stock Exchange. And so they had to be very explicit about all of the subsidies that they receive over time. And so some of the things I was able to glean was a 13% export subsidy. Uh, I was able to glean you know, uh, loans that are disproportional to their size uh, at interest rates that are uh, a fraction of what I pay. Um, we've been able to see you know, R&D subsidies, capital equipment subsidies, building subsidies. So all of these subsidies that I think a lot of us have seen, uh, they were very explicit about in their, in their uh, public documents, which you know, confirm to us more or less what the, uh, the cost delta would be uh, for a company like us to compete with a company like them. As far as, you know, recommendations, I, I have two. One I already heard by uh, the gentleman with my same last name, Mr. Rashid. <laughs> um, but the other one, we've, we've worked quite closely with the Trade Fraud Task Force, and we've learned a lot uh, by working with them. Uh, they're a, a group that's headed by the Department of Justice, but they work closely with Customs Border Protection, and they also work closely with uh, Homeland Security. And what we've learned is that uh, their mandate is civil, uh, meaning that they can only pursue cases on a civil basis. And if they want to pursue criminal, then they must work with a USA office. And so what we've learned is the coordination uh, in order to you know, let's say they, they have conviction in a case, well, they still need to work with the AUSA office in order to bring criminal and civil to bear. And as we know, trying to coordinate uh, amongst different agencies can be a challenge, and this slows down the process. And so, you know, one of the questions or requests that I have is, is it possible for us to consider uh, combining civil and criminal no. under a trade force a task force, a, tra a trade fraud task force, so that they can expedite um, this. This is this is something that I, you know, some. This is a recommendation I have, and and I work closely with uh, our counsel who used to work for the trade fraud task force, and so, you know, he was able to provide that level of insight to me. We'll take that for action. That's actually the first time I've heard that suggestion. Maybe I'll pick on um, uh, some some people from my district. Uh, we have. Uh, the shipbuilding industry represented here today, um, both uh, Pink and Terry Marinette Marine, and then we have Fairbanks Morse, which builds big engines that go into big ships. Uh, 
And on the one hand, so, so, so for your Navy business, you're, you're not competing with China in an economic sense, right? Because we're not buying Chinese Navy ships. But the health of your, that side is tied intimately to the health of commercial shipbuilding in America. Maybe talk about that as well as the broader challenges we face. Today. Sure, I'd love to. Thank you uh, for that question, Congressman. And, and I would be remiss, not only uh, you mentioned uh, one of my great suppliers, Fairbanks Morris, uh, Team Industry, who's also here is another vital part of the uh, of the frigate team. In fact, the, the uh, Silicon Valley for piping is in Northeast Wisconsin. Everybody, right. in fact, Team Industry. In, in so. fact, I, when I when I woke up this morning and, and went to work, the first thing I saw was uh, John's piping uh, being put into uh, the what will someday be the engine room of the first Constellation class frigate. That's awesome. It's just just delivered, and so a uh, great partnership there. Um, so. Uh, as, as you mentioned, so uh, I'm privileged to lead uh, Think Cantary Marinette Marine in Marinette, uh, Wisconsin, uh, and and we build warships. So it's our job uh, to build the ships that will help uh, deter and, if necessary, defeat uh, potential foreign adversaries such as the PLAN. But uh, my shipyard is owned by Finn Cantary. In, in the United States, the Finn Cantary Marine Group owns uh, several yards. Uh, in Wisconsin and down in Florida, and then worldwide, Finn Cantieri internationally is the largest ship builder in the free world, uh, or I should say, in the Western world. Uh, I don't want to exclude Japan or South Korea um, from the uh, from the free world, but it is interesting and instructive the products that Finn Cantieri builds. Uh, we build cruise ships, we build warships, and we build ships that service the the wind and oil and gas think offshore energy and all of its different components whether that's wind industry or oil and gas uh across our different lines of business um we don't build container ships we don't build large crude we don't build any of those commodity ships because subsidized chinese industry has basically cornered the market on those if you are a shipbuilder who has to compete on a fair fair level around the world you end up building ships where your quality will make a difference, where your customer will want the higher quality and it's not a cookie cutter ship. That tends to be cruise ships, that tends to be warships, that tends to be ships that service the energy industry. The cookie cutter ships, because of Chinese subsidies, are now built in China. And that's not, that is a problem for the United States because it is much harder to maintain an industrial base both at the shipyard and all the great companies that supply ships of what they need a robust and healthier a robust and healthy industrial base if you're only supplying into primarily the military market if you don't have a a large commercial shipbuilding market to supply into you don't get a healthy uh industrial base um and so you know that's that's kind of the state of play uh, and and where we see ourselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. I, I will take just a minute to to relate an anecdote from before my time at Think Cantieri about intellectual property. Um, I served, I was privileged to serve in the Navy before I was hired uh, by Think Cantieri. And my last position in the Navy, I was the commanding officer of NSWC Carterock, which is a Navy research and development um, uh, facility. And it has several state-of-the-art facilities for the research and development of ship design. And in my first counterintelligence brief after taking command, I got shown the pictures of the Chinese Scientific Shipbuilding Research Center outside of Shanghai in a place called Wuxi. And it was as if you had lifted the blueprint from Carter Rock and laid it out outside. And it had, you could see where all of the identical facilities had been kind of copied and pasted. So uh, it's not just an industry problem. It's also a government problem as far as intellectual property theft. And that those kind of test facilities are what starts a country on a high-quality Navy. And the PLAN, they have it, and they have it because they took it from us. Anything to add? Or, yeah. While we're on the shipbuilding discussion. Is it on? Good afternoon, everyone. Congressman and the and the select committee, thank you for inviting us. Fairbanks Morris Defense, uh, uh, down we're located in Wisconsin. I like the numbers hearing out here. I got, I've got got a lot of thoughts, but I'll, I'll keep it short. Uh, first comment, we, we've been around 151 years. I like your length of time. And Steve, welcome to the club. I start my 45th year here in a couple of days. So uh, you're a young man, that's good. 
But this industry, you know, I just taking some notes down. Uh, China doesn't play fair by the rules. We all know that. We opened up the door in 1979, just a little historical fact, when we wanted free trade around the world. Everybody hear me fine on this? And China thought that it was a good opportunity to get in this business. And China found out that, you know what? They can beat everyone because they got lower cost. And they got lower cost, and they found out that they didn't have to play by the rules. So they're in a situation where why would they honor any laws that we make? I, I had a lot of thoughts in my head. How do we compete with them? And I really don't know if we have a good answer because it's not just the United States. It's the world. I deal with countries all around the world. And if you go into Europe, uh, it, Italy, Italy's fighting this. Germany's fighting this. France is fighting this. UK, Australia, Canada, the United States, we're all fighting this. So they're not playing by the, the rules. You know, we got 300, 320 million people in the United States here. What do they got? 1.3 billion. They got us. It's a numbers game. They got us beat just from the sheer numbers. Money. They've made so much money in the last 44 years of doing this free trade that they can buy anything they want. They're buying markets around the world. They're buying all the natural resources. Uh, oh, is that the end of the buzzer? The that, end of the game? That's so, a, the Chinese, so, Chinese buzzer. We can't so, have this conversation anymore. So, so my question is, do they have a threat? Is there anything we, it's really a question for the, the, uh, the panel. What can we do to compete yeah. this? Because they, they, I, I deal around the country with other companies and it's interesting how uh, you've got a patent and no disrespect, your patent's great when people play, play fair. All right. There's countries around the world that won't sell things into the Chinese market because they know they sell it. And within a very short time, months, not years, They'll produce the same thing you're doing and don't think their quality is not getting good. It's really good. They've got some of the best foundries in the world. I've been over there. I've checked them out. Completely amazing. So not to put you on the spot, but I'd like to know yeah. what does our government have as far as options? Well, Pat, I actually think you identified part of the solution, which is that by uh, saying that we that Italy's dealing with this, Germany's dealing with this. We have a network of allies and partners that are all dealing with a common threat. That if we have a common approach to pushing back against that threat, we can pool our resources and expertise. And even though the Chinese economy is massive, even though the country is massive, when you put America together with our allies and partners, we, we just we can't we can't be beaten. We simply can't be beaten. Now, the other thing I would say to the comment that was made about you can't out subsidize China. Our secret sauce, I, I think, is innovation. Uh, our secret sauce is we got a bunch of flexible, free-thinking people in America that like to take big risks in a way that's not the same anywhere else. And we have to double down on that. I actually like to plant a flag there, maybe come back to it uh, with Craig uh, and talk a little bit about innovation and technology. But first, I want to recognize Darren uh, for a question that he might have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this issue of tariff evasion by um, SOEs coming into the market, I mentioned earlier uh, Sunsong as the competitor to Plues. But as we look at um, you know, these SOEs customers in the United States, how do we make them more cognizant and responsive to the issue of tariff evasion? I don't know, uh, David, you wanna talk about that or others, please feel free to jump in. Thank you for that question. Um, that's a tough one. I was uh, mentioning to somebody, I was reading uh, the Madison papers last night and reading about how you know different uh, uh, groups have different interests, and then the role of government, therefore, is to uh, rise above and and solve for those interests. Um, and so I I recognize that in my past I've uh, pursued interests that perhaps weren't necessarily always consistent with what is best for the group as a whole. And so this is this is a very tough question. I mean, everybody is is just so tied into their interests and we need a bigger vision, I think. I mean, we can talk about policy and so forth, but we need to buy into a vision, in my view, as to what it is that we're really trying to achieve here. And we need everybody hand in the huddle and say yes, in spite of the fact that it is more expensive to do things one way, at least for a period of time, we're willing to do that in order to, for a bigger vision, something bigger than us and our immediate, you know, for the next quarter. How we achieve that, I don't know. That is the long-term goal, but, in the sh but I think government has a massive role to play in the short run in order to let people know that, hey, even if, even if you are not the one doing it, but you 
have a sense. It's your obligation to understand, and it's your obligation to investigate, and it's your obligation to respect the law. Your thoughts on that? Well, quickly, while we're talking tariffs, Bob, so the tariff that has helped you in terms of chassis and it helped you to add a production line here. So when does that expire? And then when, what's the solution after it expires? Yeah, so for us, we are uh, taking the approach. It, it, we're about two, a little over two years into a, a five-year evaluation period. So we are, we've been using that time to position ourselves to be successful if and when that tariff goes away. And we do that through being more competitive, being more efficient. Uh, some of the equipment that you see behind us here, it's adding automation. It's driving out labor. It's not uh, eliminating jobs, but moving those people to build more trailers in other areas. It's creating more high tech, more higher paying jobs. So for us, uh, we are executing a strategy through automation on part build, as well as robotic welding, as well as shifting from painting to galvanizing, uh, that we are taking labor out of our product. We plan to get down to between 15 and 20 hours per chassis. That's total labor all in to build what, what you guys see stacked up behind it, each individual unit. Yeah. And if we can achieve that, it doesn't matter where in the world that, that these are built. If they're using less expensive labor that will not overcome the cost of transportation to get it to our market. So if that's the case, then we can win. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to set up to do. My fear is that only works if China doesn't dump, if, if they don't subsidize. Uh, so that is a pretty significant threat to us. Thank you. I'd like to, oh, Sony, did you have a question? By the way, my whole team was at uh, her facility was that last week already? I've aged a lot since then. It was a phenomenal tour, so thank yeah. you. Everyone from DC and the district went to tour. Thank you. Um, I assume that's yes, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, uh, Chairman. I um, I think that I, I work for Worthington Industries. We're headquartered in Columbus, Ohio, and we're a steel industrial manufacturer serving a number of applications. A big part of our business is pressure cylinders. And that's really uh, been an area that China has has us under attack. We've filed a few anti -dump for anti-dumping. We believe that they are taking a systemic, uh, thoughtful, targeted approach on our industries, uh, so we they can remove uh, essential industries from from U.S. domestic production, and um, we're we're fighting that. Uh, I appreciate the question about solutions. Like, what can we do? Um, there's been a lot of conversation around trade, which um, we certainly support the the Fighting Trade Cheats Act, the Leveling the Playing Field 2.0. Um, we also think that there are opportunities. Actually, ranking member, you have a cylinder production facility, not one of ours, but one someone in our industry. Uh, we've um, and introduced the. Uh, the HR 3404 around cylinder safety and foreign manufacturing. And the idea there is around giving more teeth and resources to our regulator. So the regulator of our product is DOT, uh, an agency under FEMSA, is FEMSA, and really giving them the ability to uh, have more resource, resources to go to manufacturers in China and do inspections like we have to face here in the US just to make it more of a level playing field because today they they you know there's a, a there's a different structure so a lot of our companies around this table are regulated and we feel like there's a good opportunity there to to really look at that system and ask more questions on the front end whenever a foreign manufacturer, especially these opaque locations like China, are applying to, to ship into the US, we need to ask more questions, be more transparent on the front end. And that's one solution that we had. Thank you, appreciate that. I wanna bring Craig Dickman into the conversation. And I'm picking on Craig because uh, he used to be my boss. And uh, in order to get me to run for Congress, he fired me. Um, and so I, I have to uh, pick it up, but Craig, I, maybe, sort of bring you in in the following way. A lot of what we're talking about is def defense, right? It's we're, we're, we're trying to play defense again with what China's 
you and us. I view you in running Title Town Tech, which has this mission of kind of bringing cutting edge technology and innovation to the Midwest um, uh, as part of the offense. It's harnessing our ability just to out-compete and out-innovate China. Maybe talk a little bit about that or just how you see this threat broadly. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that, Chairman Gallagher. And uh, it's nice to say formally Chairman Gallagher, so I'm yeah. enjoying that. Ranking Member Krishna Muthi, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, Representative LaHood, thank you so much for being here. I think it's so appropriate that you're here in the Midwest because in the Midwest, I don't think there's any question. We know how to solve problems. We know how to make things, I think, better than anyone else in the world. Wisconsin in particular, the Midwest in general, really leads in this. That's one of the reasons why I think as we were creating Title Town Tech, uh, unlike a lot of venture in other areas, we said it's really important to focus on innovation and the making of things. And so one, I think that's really important that, that you're here having this discussion today. Second, I think this is a unique conversion, convergence when you think about the issues that the committee is dealing with, because we've talked a lot about fair trade and having a level of playing field, that's critical. Intellectual property theft, which has been you know, extreme within some of the industries and making things very important. Third, you think about some of the technologies that manufacturing companies employ, controllers, servers, technology, computer vision, and thinking about the cyber risks that come with critical infrastructure when you're looking at the underlying technology and the source of that underlying technology is very visible here in manufacturing. And then fourth, the creation of new intellectual property. Uh, because you think about the creation of new intellectual property, and we've been involved in some tech spinoffs as an example from universities, and you really have to pay attention to the source of where that intellectual property is being created and the roots that it has back in other areas, such as supported by the Chinese Communist Party. So, so much of the issues that the committee is dealing with is really converging here in manufacturing. And so I think it's really appropriate that we're here. But I think the other thing is I do have an incredible optimism for the U.S. economy and incredible optimism for the manufacturing sector, because I do think at the core, I have the great privilege of seeing innovators, young people, people who have been in industry, people who have seen problems, coming up with new solutions to solve problems. And ultimately, you know, we can continue to lead through innovation. While they're playing with old intellectual property, we continue to create new. And I think the we're on this really unique time within the economy that I would encourage you to both look for fair markets in the past, intellectual property currently, but really look at innovation and the ability to support the innovative economy and make these connections between innovators and existing manufacturers. And then also recognize that with this innovation comes a great need for transparency and transparency both around, you know, what the roots are of the intellectual property transparency of how it's funded and transparency of how it's used. And so I applaud the work of the committee. I'm a great optimist when we think about what happens to, uh, to be the potential of this manufacturing economy. But I also believe that that only will be realized through the good work of this committee. Thank you. You're optimistic in part because you no longer have to deal with me every single day as your employee. I get that. But Mike. Hello. Thank you. My Mike Gray from Walker Forge. We're located in Clintonville, Wisconsin, which is about 40 miles west of, of Green Bay. Been with the company 18 years, uh, running the sales department. Uh, so I've seen it firsthand uh, what China can do to an organization. Um, we're a third generation. We've been around about 75 years. Uh, uh, current, my boss, current CEO, is a grandson of the founder. And really what I'd like to do is kind of uh, dovetail on what uh, Mark from Marinette Marine was talking about as far as, as military uh, threats from, from China. But we, we have a little bit unique spin on it because we're, we also supply commercial parts along with military parts. And our commercial business is much larger than our military business. However, what's important to to bring up here is um, we've we've lost significant business at least since I've been with a company to China and we've seen a 30 to 35 percent on average when we can get data uh, price discrepancy that's obviously 
subsidizing and everything else that was covered in China. But you know, the way we look at it is, is we need our strong commercial business, robust commercial business that's being attacked by China. And Section 301 has certainly helped, don't get me wrong, but it's not the end all. We're still under threat from China and a strong commercial business and an efficient running operation also supports our military uh, components that we supply to military. We need both to be strong, especially the commercial end. And just to give you, give you a little example of some of the uh, key components that we've supplied or do supply currently to the military, M240, M240, uh, M242 machine gun components, wheel spindles for JTLV, uh, the Humvee, um, lugs and retainer rings for the blue 109 and 136 bomb. And also we make components for heavy equipment, off-road construction equipment used in infrastructure, not only in, in military, but obviously uh, commercial infrastructure. So it's all key and it all kind of dovetails back to strong commercial being threatened by China that helps support um, our military business, which again, is a direct threat on national security. Let's Thank you, Mike. Raja, did you have a? Well, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say something uh, based on what Craig was saying, which is, I do think that innovation ultimately is our strong suit, but really, I think the key to innovation is freedom. We have something so precious in this country, which the CCP uh, hates, which is freedom. Freedom of thought freedom to invent, freedom, in, freedom to invest, freedom to think big. And that's what I think most of the people around this table have done all their lives, along with the founders of their companies and what they're doing going forward. It's so bad right now, the squelching of freedom by the Chinese Communist Party, that their economy is in a tailspin as we speak. And Mike and I have talked about this quite a bit, because what's worse, a company, a, a country uh, which is growing strong and therefore can better fuel the ambitions of Xi Jinping or a country that's growing weak and that its leadership might then start to do aggressive things to try to distract attention from their economic problems. Either way, that's kind of the state of affairs. But what I wanted to turn to was a question about workers, because I think everybody around this table I'm suspecting is having a problem finding good talent to grow your businesses. And I believe very strongly in skills-based and vocational education. I think that we don't invest enough in that. And I would just be curious, I know Steve has strong viewpoints about this, but what are your viewpoints about what more we should be doing to invest in skills-based and vocational education at the federal level or otherwise so that you have a talented workforce going forward? Any thoughts? Anybody? Well, Jim? Oh. Yep. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jim Myers from Metal Tech International. Uh, we're a group of foundries in uh, Wisconsin, uh, Missouri, and uh, Ohio. So we employ a lot of uh, skilled workers, right? Both uh, in the foundries and in subsequent processing of metal components for fairly complicated industries. We've talked about the Navy ships, we supply components to the Navy, uh, to the Marines, to the Air Force, uh, to all the Department of Defense uh, constituents um, and, and other challenging industries such as uh, petrochem and, and energy. So those components that we make, are we, we've struggled with finding workers that are able to do low volume, high complexity work. Um, and largely that's that's been a big transition in the last i'll say 30 years my my experience from high school on where there was a lot more vocational training in simple things in in auto repair you use technology when you're repairing your car that was easily a skill that was transitioned into the manufacturing environment uh, to use metal melting equipment um, x-ray equipment other types of uh, industrial equipment the students that we have coming from uh, school today in high school are often trained more in coding, which is useful to us. But a majority of those students 
don't have uh, the combination of uh, the physical skills and the mental skills to, to really take on the positions and grow our business, grow our workforce um, with retirement and uh, a, a sort of the, the, uh, the generation before where there were many more, uh, many more individuals with those skills um, uh, straight from school. So I, I think that as that activity uh, at your level, what can you do? It's, it's further um, skills um, growth in high schools, in vocation, vocational schools, uh, and, and, and other areas. Um, just stepping back from, from that question for a second, I, I'd like to echo some of the, the comments that, uh, that Mark made, uh, you know, as a, as again, a, a primary metals uh, market user, we're very concerned about the price of steel, uh, the price uh, stability of other elements that are necessary for our business to supply parts to uh, shipyards, uh, and their availability, such as in rare earth elements. Those um, elemental materials, there are as many levers available as there are elements on the periodic table for the CCP to pull in a small way that affects our pricing ability and our ability um, uh, to manufacture components and, and have material ready for um, our Department of Defense customers. So we feel that's a very, a very uh, needed area for, for, for looking at as well. John, did you have a comment? And what do you? Uh, first, John Panetti, Team Industries. Uh, we're an industrial pipe and tank fabricator, 100% UA union. As far as manpower, uh, we partner heavily with the, with the plumbers and steam fitters on supplying our people. We had a 36-year partnership with them, and we've grown expert, you know, uh, very rapidly with them. We do, we do have a manpower shortage right now, but my number one concern is uh, U.S. security. And I want you to think about this. Our great country runs on two things wires and pipes. I can't tell you a lot about wires, but I can tell you a lot about pipes. And if you would consider this, if we would ever come into a conflict with China and one of our power plants would hit, take a hit on, one of the, uh, on any type of, and we're without power through the transmission of wires, we need and this really concerns me, we need the strong base of the foundry people, Walker Forge and Metal Tech. And if we lose that to China and they control that, that is gonna be a major, major issue with this country. Now we're a, we're a Navy approved fabricator and we partner with Fincan Thierry, Marinette Marine on the, on the ship side of it. But this is a major issue, as we all know, but secure, you know, security here for this country, that is vital. And what it's gonna take to keep us secure at this country. And how fast can we react to once a, once a hit is taken at this country? Thank you, John. Steve, do you have thoughts? Yeah. Hello? There you go. There you go. Uh, thank you. I'm I just want to say, uh, I see a light developing at the end of the tunnel. And it's shown just by the cooperation and the gathering that we have here. So thank you for presenting that, showing us the solidarity between everyone on the common cause. Uh, I think we are going in the right direction. But for the people that need to jump up and get some of these jobs, and I can relate to uh, trying to find good quality employees. In a manufacturing environment, it's a little bit different. We have pushed for generations. Everyone go to college, which is good. But we also need people with hand skills, mechanical skills. We need to develop a lot of this training, vocational training, educational training, starting in the high school, leading into community colleges. These need to be incentivized and helped with through the U.S. government and corporations develop partnerships with community colleges, community schools, 
Uh, this next generation is looking for leadership. We need to provide it to them. We need to show them the way that there's plenty of opportunities still left uh, in America to work. We have great corporations. I'm just blown away and impressed by uh, my peers up here, other people, and some of the discussions we've had. But developing these partnerships, starting early, uh, also the, uh, providing grants and incentives to these corporations. We talk about ingenuity, innovation. This takes, they got to take a chance. They're taking some risks. So we ought to have their backs too. It ought to be everyone together. And I'm really impressed and proud to be sitting here with your group on the select committee watching how everyone's working together. So thank you very much. I approve that message. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One observation, I, I agree with everything the ranking member said about vocational uh, training. And, and I, I feel like everyone pays lip service to this idea that not everybody needs to go to college. But then you ask a parent, well, what about your kid? They'll still say, well, my, my kid needs to go to a four-year college. So I think we have a long way, even if we get the incentives right, to overcome the stigmatization of an alternative path. And can that's I, what- Can I right, jump yeah. in, Mike? I think you're right. You're absolutely right about that. And I think that every child is going to have a different journey and parents with those children should decide. But there's got to be a greater emphasis on skill acquisition. Yeah. Even in high school, like even if those kids end up going to- four-year college or community college or trade school, they've got to learn skills. They've got to have something so that if they, you know, they can have access to the greatest social welfare program devised by human beings, a J-O-B. If you can't get a job, even after high school, then our, I think our educational system has failed our young people. That's my opinion. Yeah, Mark. And then uh, yeah, I would yeah. like to, uh, um, one, totally agree, but, uh, uh, a, a follow-on story that emphasizes that uh, at, uh, at Fin Cantary Marinette Marine, we partner with uh, the local uh, district attorney of Marinette uh, County and help fund their diversion program. So if you've got a young person who maybe got themselves into some level of trouble, but they're not violent and having them sit in a jail isn't going to do any good, you know, we're both one of the potential um, sources of employment for such a person, but we also help in funding the DA's uh, staff that that manages the diversion program. Uh, and that's how I came to find out in talking to the district attorney because she was having problems hiring a new assistant district attorney to fill uh, a hole in her workforce. Uh, and I said, uh, I found out I pay more to a first class welder than the Marinette County pays to a district attorney. And, and you don't have to go to a four-year college. You don't have to have a license. You didn't have to pass the, the Wisconsin bar. Uh, if you show up as an apprentice uh, about uh, between 18 and 25 months later, uh, you'll be making, you know, out of high school, I will get you all the training and you will show up as a welder making more than the DAs do in that county. I have a plan B. Right, so, <laughs> yeah. right. so, so for anyone, you know, who's interested, we're hiring. And, and we're training. Yeah. This, um, it, it is a real problem of not having enough vocational talent pool. But we've had, as we've talked about since 1979, for the last 40 years, we've had a siphoning off of manufacturing from the US. So now going back to what are parents telling their kids, they're, they're advising them where the industries are, where you'll get the jobs. Right. So we have to bring back the manufacturing. We have to have that renaissance completed. And then the two are intertwined. Right. Then the vocational skill sets will start appearing. Well, the way we address it is um, we have to do a lot of our own training and a lot of things that are not found here. We have to import that skill set from outside the U.S. I wish I didn't have to, but that's how it is. Right. Now. Great point. I'm told we have four minutes left. So if anyone has a thought that they. Yep. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, that's what, that's what Raja does to me on the committee when I doesn't <laughs> like my. If anyone has a thought they want to get out that they haven't, and failing that, I'm, I'll go. Yes, yes, Bob. Yeah, so I, I'll first explain our situation. So um, we were successfully able to get the tariff in place, uh, but ch the, our Chinese competition has quickly shifted to other areas to work around the tariff. So 
In our situation, they've done that in three main ways. Uh, one is they're providing inappropriate subsidies to a facility in Thailand uh, to shift their production. They're producing out of that facility. Uh, two, they're circumventing as they're doing much of the assembly work, et cetera, on uh, smaller components, shifting it to that Thailand facility, doing the assembly, a lot of the smaller assembly in China, and then moving it into the U.S. that route. And then three, uh, they're transloading. They're, they're loading uh, Thailand manufactured, which much of it is in China anyway, but uh, Thailand manufactured product to China, transitioning it to another ship, blending it with product that's coming out of their chassis facility in China and representing it into the U.S. So we have uh, tracked that. We've collected data. We've filed, uh, you know, the, the EPA uh, petition. That whole process, now we've, we've had relief for a little over two years, but China's been avoiding those tariffs for about a year and a half. Wow. So we are just now to the point where uh, it's able to get some attention and be addressed. Well, thank you. Uh, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Let's wait till the buzzer. So what, what you're doing to, um, you know, on the level of playing field 2.0, to uh, speed up the process, to, to react to those types of, that type of uh, tariff evasion is extremely important uh, to keep the healthy industry even after the tariff is put in place. Right. Thank you, Bob. Darren, final thoughts. Um, <clears throat> just, to, I wanna mention one thing. Part of the, I think, genesis of this committee is to expose the malign activities of the CCP. And I think we've done a fairly good job of doing that. But to understand kind of the whole of government approach the CCP takes to this is sophisticated. It's un unbelievable what they do. And I just want to, some of you may have seen this. Um, yesterday, it came out, uh, this is the title from a political article, China behind the largest ever digital influence operation. And it goes on to say, people with ties to Chinese law enforcement agencies conducted the largest known covert digital influence operation aimed at discrediting the West and promoting Beijing's agenda across more than 50 social media and online platforms, um, according to this study. On Facebook alone, clandestine users with direct ties to the CCP racked up over 550,000 followers spouting lies about the United States' alleged role in creating COVID-19 and criticizing our support for Taiwan. This should highlight to everybody the extent, the sophistication, and the planning that goes into and what we're up against. So that's one small way of just exposing what we're up against when we, when we think about the whole of government approach the CCP take, takes. Great point, great point. Raja. Any, anybody who didn't get a chance to speak? Jay, Jay. Jay did you want? Well, uh, my name is Jay Annis. I'm uh, with McNally Industries, Grantsburg, Wisconsin. Uh, we've only been around for 80 years. Uh, we're <laughs> Department of Defense only contractor, and um, we've been dedicated to providing, you know, metal manufacturing and complex assembly and engineering to the Department of Defense only for the past 80 years. I guess the only comment I would make to kind of wrap several of the, the comments together uh, from our perspective is, um, you know, we have bandwidth today, all right? We have capacity today. Uh, we've identified, you know, opportunities to support national security through support of Taiwan and trying to understand the, you know, the willingness, the resources, the energy applied, you know, to supporting Taiwan beyond just the fancy brand new weapon systems to sustainment of their existing infrastructure and military ability. That's something that we're trying to understand. How, what role can we play? And so with, you know, with significantly less GDP applied, you know, from Taiwan and a lot of energy applied to the high technology items, you know, it doesn't seem like there's a lot being applied to sustainment. You know, Taiwan fields uh, so, um, weapon systems that we build components for, the Phalanx weapon system, the Mark VI ammunition hoist and helicopter uh, tooling, um, along with our other capabilities to support sustainment and obsolescence engineering. And so I guess I would kind of come back around to what can be done to help with the workforce. Well, like you mentioned earlier, 
if we had a robust growing manufacturing facility in Grantsburg, Wisconsin, that gave a high quality of life, because we know we actually have a lot of success engaging with local high schools, local trade schools, we bring in people. Um, but ha being that shining, great example of a high quality of life where people get to use their hands and minds to support the national defense, to, to us, that's what's going to help us continue to grow and be solvent and, and you know, and be a key player on, for national security that we're very proud of in Grantsburg. So uh, I'll, st I'll stop there. That's fantastic. Raja. Well, I was just going to say um, this has been really terrific. And I want to say thank you to all of you for coming and Bob for hosting us. Um, I think that the what I see is there's a common understanding of the problems facing us. Uh, we've talked about dumping. We've talked about um, tariff evasion. We've talked about uh, cyber. We've talked about theft of intellectual property. We also talk about a lack of manpower here that's ready to take up the challenge of building your businesses. Now the question is, Mike, I think, and Darren, can we, on a bipartisan basis, come together? and take what we've learned from this and other uh, similar hearings and come up with solutions? And I think the answer is yes. I think people of goodwill on both sides can come together with common cause and, and figure out how to deal with this because you know this isn't low stakes, it's high stakes. It's the highest stakes. What standard of living are our children and grandchildren and our future generations going to enjoy that's what it's all about the beauty is that i think we have the solutions the question is are we going to execute great thoughts uh i want to echo your thanks of everybody who came here to participate in the roundtable some of you drove from very far away uh it was a big investment of your time just please know that this this matters um uh are paying attention uh in particular the chinese communist party is paying attention i can almost predict that there will be um, a propaganda piece tomorrow attacking what's been said today. Uh, they pay attention to everything we do on the Select Committee on China. So having a forum like this where people can come from different political parties, different industries, and share ideas, it sends a powerful signal. I want to especially thank my colleagues, uh, Darren and Raja, for taking time out of their busy schedules to join. You have no idea how hard it is to get three members of Congress in the same place when we're not in session. The compound probability that we could pull this off was, I mean, it's not zero, but it's statistically indistinguishable from zero. So we did the impossible. Um, and then in particular, I want to thank um, uh, Steve, Mamoon, and of course, uh, Bob for his hospitality. Your facility is absolutely incredible. Uh, the tour we got, uh, it just gives me hope for just the power of, of manufacturing in Wisconsin and the Midwest more broadly. And a final thought I had as we were walking back from seeing the chassis, you know, on the select committee, we spent a lot of time talking about economic and technological competition with China in terms of things like AI, quantum, solar, you know, kind of like next generation, cool, sexy technology. Now, I think chassis are sexy, but, you know, maybe there's less of an appreciation for things like that behind us. But all of the goods we buy then get shipped on containers that sit on chassis. So when you buy Christmas gifts, for your kids, you're relying on the hard work that happens here. When you do anything uh, to, that allows our, our economy to function day to day, you're relying on the hard work of the men and women in this facility, many of whom we see back there. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, you, you have our backs, and so now I think it's important that we have yours in terms of what we do from the federal level. So thank you, Bob, and thank you everyone for this. Appreciate it. I, don't want your cookies, I know, I'm gonna get some on the way out. So. <laughs> Awesome.